sat down and been, you know, indoctrinated and learned and studied the Old Testament. So we're, you know, coming from a background where we're all in this New Testament religion where we are, you know, looking at the roof of a building and trying to figure out what the building is without having seen the foundation or the walls or the floor plan. And especially when you're into something that's as figurative as end time prophecy, eschatology, we're reading Revelation with no basis of understanding, uh, no contextual reference of anything that's being mentioned here. There is so much reference in the book of Revelation to Second Temple worship tradition, um, Jewish tradition, um, Old Testament prophecies, and without that basis of understanding, we're walking into Revelation, and I mean, it's as wide open as an artist's, you know, uh, uh, canvas. We can just pretty much create any imagine anything we can imagine, and you know, we can probably find a verse or two in there to make it sound like that. So, you know, we've come out of this. You know, what is Babylon? Well, it's New York. People here think it's Bolivia because, you know, yes, a little tiny landlocked country of 10 million people in the heart of South America. That's what the Bible is all about, you know, <laughs> and the rest of the world just hasn't got there yet. Um, so, you know, we think it's, you know, this mark of the beast. We think it's technology. We think it's government. We think it's civil control. And, you know, if we just had a little tiny bit of knowledge about the Old Testament, the mark of the beast is so easy to recognize because it's a carbon copy of a mark that's been there since the very beginning, all the way back to Cain. And it's the exact same thing. It's, you know, just kind of a, a twisted man-made copy of that. But it's a mark on the head and on the hand of believers and people who believe or who belong to the creator. Um, this beast is another party and it has its own mark to associate its believers with itself. But once we understand and, you know, know how to recognize the original mark, this other mark out of Revelation all of a sudden loses all of its mystery and it just becomes painfully obvious and, and simple to interpret. It's, you know, I figured why not write a study about it? It's going to help a lot of people. I, I agree. I think it will help a lot of people. And, and that I think the, the point you made there, it, it's very simple. The problem is we don't like simple. We like complex. We, we have this, we have a problem in our human nature and, and the word that I would use to describe it is lust. And we lust for this like secret knowledge. This, you know, it, it can't be simple. Lusticism is what we call this. <laughs> there you go. It, it can't be simple, right? If it's simple, then I, that's nah. I want, I want this piece of knowledge that nobody else knows and that, you know, the secret, the secret evil governments out there are, you know, they're talking about it and we're going to, we're going to sneak in and, you know, and Alex Jones is going to tell us, you know, this, this information we need, right? Uh, and, and the it's only like, person that really has the inside track is the guy <laughs> making YouTube videos wearing a kooky red hat. That's the guy. <laughs> He's there the only go. one that has eyewitness for, you know, knowledge of these things. He's the only one peeking in the window at all of the Illuminati meetings. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. And and, and I think, you know, we, we have this lust, right? And and we want we want this knowledge and we won't we won't I guess the word is kind of hard to use, but settle for the simplicity of scripture. Scripture, although it can be very deep and you can dig and dig and dig and learn new things every time you dig, when you go into the Hebrew and you start studying from that perspective, at the same time, it's very simple and it, and it gives us the, the, the answers that we need. And as you said, there's a mark that's been around for a long time. And uh, really, there's there's multiple marks that have been around for a long time, <laughs> but but Absolutely. the mark the mark of the Creator has been around for a very long time, and understanding that mark will give us, I mean, clear sight into the mark of the beast. So I want you to explain that mark uh, to to our our viewers and our listeners today. That this mark of the Creator, you, you mentioned something, and I think we can go there in Scripture. You mentioned this idea of it being on our head and on our hand. Uh, which Correct. sounds very similar to what we read in Revelation about the mark of the beast. So, so explain, explain this. 
Well, there are uh, at least three parts in Torah where it talks about a mark on the believers on the head and hand. And in two of these places, it just refers to the law, plain and simply, uh, the law of Moses. It's called the law of Moses, of course, because it's found in the books of Moses, not because Moses invented it. We know that uh, the law that's called the law of Moses actually comes from the Creator. Um, but obedience to that law, that law is the mark on our heads and hands. And that's basically all it says in two of the three references to this mark. But in the third, and if you want to look at this, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. But uh, I'm not going to flip back and forth because I'm not that talented. So it's all I can do to keep my train of thought going while I'm talking. If you uh, expect me to flip through back and forth through Bible, forget it, I'm lost. Um, but anyway, there's one other piece where it actually, you know, this is what we call the Shema. And, or Shema, depending on how you pronounce it. But it begins Shema Yisrael in Hebrew, which means hear, O Israel. And when you look at the Hebrew names for, you know, the books of the Bible and different liturgical pieces, um, the, the names that are put on them, you know, I guess um, the Hebrew mindset isn't a particularly creative mindset because they really just take the first word of the thing and turn that into its name. Um, Genesis is Bereshit because that's the Hebrew for in the beginning. That's how the book begins. So very simple naming. So sh the word Shema isn't something, you know, mystical or magical. It's just the first Hebrew word of this uh, verse. And, you know, once upon a time, we had an expert in the law come up to Messiah and ask him, you know, what is the great commandment of the law? And he answers with this particular passage. And he says, Hear, O Israel. And, you know, then he said, our creator, Yah, is one, and him only shalt thou serve. So aside from just having the law itself and all of the commandments being this mark, there's one particular point, And this is the point that Messiah said was the most important command of the whole law. And this doesn't just give us the law. It also includes the law. But this particular passage gives us the greatest commandment of the entire law, and part of this commandment identifies to us who our Creator is. So, not to turn this into a sacred names argument, some of us pronounce the, the name of our Creator as Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yehovah, and, you know, um, different people put different levels of importance. You know, you absolutely have to be pronouncing it the way I do, or you're just completely lost. I'm not trying to address any of that. What I am trying to address is it gives us his name. And I think in Hebrew, we can agree that it's yod Hey vav Hey or yod Hey wow Hey, depending on how, you know, what, what iteration of the Hebrew language you want to refer to. But we have his name and we have his number. He is one. And that knowledge was given to Cain to protect him from destruction because he said, if I leave here, this world is going to destroy me. And so our creator put a symbol, put a sign on his head and we think, oh, it was a physical mark and everyone would look at it and say, oh, don't mess with that guy. You know, it wasn't. What he gave him was knowledge and understanding. You know, after Cain repented, after he said, yes, I messed up, please help. Uh, I'm going to be destroyed if you don't. Our Creator gave him the knowledge and said, you know what, you're going to be protected by this sign I'm going to put on you. This is my name, this is my number. <laughs> and you think, how, how is that going to protect him from something? Well, the real destruction that we face in this world, I mean, you know, it isn't a Tyrannosaurus Rex waiting to bite our head off when we walk around the corner. It's not, you know, a man-eating land shark knocking at the door. The kind of destruction we face is, you know, being lost. It's being deceived. It's being led down the wrong path. So when I know who I serve and how many he is, you know, the next time somebody knocks on my door and says, hey, I'm here to bring you the gospel of Buddha. Buddha, well, you know, that's not the one I serve. Thanks, but no thanks. You know, when they come up and say, 
well, you know, your God's only one and that's great, but I want to tell you about mine. You know, we're a little bit better off than you. We've got three gods. Our God is a trinity. A trinity, huh? Well, you know, I don't know about trinities. I, I, My mark just says he is one, and, you know, it's so simple that a, a two-year-old can count to that on his hand. So I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and stick with that and not let you come into my house either. So whenever we try to understand what is the mark of our creator, it's not something that was ever, ever a visible marking or, you know, engraving or something that was on the head or the hand, but it was always something that was uh, that, a figurative mark. What's on the head represents what other people can see when they look at us. What's on the hand in our Western mindset, we think, well, that means, you know, action and what you do. But actually, the hand is what you yourself can see. So this mark is on two places on our body. It's what we're looking at, and it's what we're telling ourselves, and it's what the rest of the world sees. It's what we're telling them. So it's what's coming into our eyes, and it's what's coming out of our mouths, basically. We know what his law is. We know what his name is, and we know what his number is. And with those three things, we identify with our God as opposed to any other God in this world. That's that's really, really good. And I hope that you guys caught that. I mean, this is this is such a simple thing. And in, in the OCMR chat room, you know, we have a comment. It's so obvious nobody can see it. You know, and and I that's that's a great comment because because the thing is, this is a very simple thing. Uh, you know, the Shema, he mentioned it in, in Devarim or Deuteronomy chapter six, starting in verse four, and, and it goes through and it tells us what it is. And I know that in your article, Paul, you talk about this and, and you use a word that I think is a very important word to describe this. You say uh, it's worship. The, the mark is, has to do a, or has to do a lot with worship. Let me find it here. Uh, um, let's see, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think I read it. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> You're not. Um, it has everything to do with worship because that mark is what identifies who to whom we belong and whom we worship. Yeah, and 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 that you know we've been talking about this um, this for a long time on the morning show, and just kind of a little bit of a preface here. We've been talking about fear, and we've been talking about how fear is worship. Where your fear is, what you are afraid of, is actually what you're submitting to, or what you're bowing down to, what you're worshiping. And uh, and I think that's important here, because if you think about it, we, we kind of discussed the secret knowledge, right? Something that's too complex for the entire, for everybody to see. And, and what is it? It's fear. It's fear of the RFID chip. It's fear of the the some kind of literal stamp on your forehead it's fear of you know the the you know the the mark on your shirt if they, when when they all come the, for the concentration camps i mean we've got this fear of these the the world system if you want to use that um and and i, I wanted to warn you because when you are afraid of that system you are kind of presenting to the world who you are worshiping in other words you are you are really wearing a mark and you don't even know it uh, and so, so this is this is why it's so important to understand that that worship has such an important thing to. It's it's so important, and it's it's a very very uh, big deal, and has a lot to do with this mark. And so, and so, go ahead, Paul. Oh, I was just going to go off on one small tangent uh, as you were talking about the fear doctrines and you know the constant the new world order, one world government, one world currency, one world religion, and you know, we are in Torah. We have a level of understanding of the Bible that we know automatically puts us above 90x percent of this world. But we also have to look very critically because the more we know, the harder it is to keep learning. And we still have some fragments of our old religion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, our old gods don't die easily. They try to linger. They try to stay around. They try to assert themselves. So where did these doctrines of new world orders and one world governments and one world religions, where did these come from? Did these come from Torah? Did these come from the spirit? Did these come from other people who keep Torah? Well, no. You know, these came from our old religion. These are rooted in, 
you know, conspiracy theories from hundreds of years ago. And the point that I want to make that I think is extremely poignant whenever we're considering the relevance of all of these doctrines is what is the world going